My name is Lamar Graft. I'm the Associate Director of the North Carolina Agri-Medicine Institute. We do safety and health programs for farmers, foresters, and fishermen across the state of North Carolina. This class was designed to give people a better understanding of poultry, livestock, and farm equipment injuries and illnesses. We're going to talk about uh, ag trauma today. Uh, there's a few other things that we're going to talk about as we go through. We're going to talk about risk-taking behavior. Uh, just a show of hands, how many of you consider yourselves risk takers? Anybody? Six people? Six, okay. And how many of you have never used a handheld cell phone while you're driving a car? One person. One person. So the rest of you, the rest of you that raised your hands before are liars because according to the National Safety Council, using a handheld cell phone while you're driving a car, not texting, that's way worse, uh, but just using the handheld cell phone while you're driving a car is like taking two drinks of alcohol before you drive a car. Now, I'm not going to ask how many of you have done that. And so uh, uh, we are risk takers. Uh, part of the reason that farmers especially get injured a lot at such high rates is because they are risk takers as well. They're around a lot of things that can cause injury. And so we're going to look at that. We're going to look a little bit at risk taking behavior in the very first part of it. But I've got just a short video clip that I want you to see first. So let's take a look at this. In case you missed that, uh, <laughs> That is available on YouTube, and also uh, they downloaded a copy of that here. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, anybody who wants a copy of this or of my PowerPoint presentation, you're welcome to it. I, I ask that you maybe give credit to me, but uh, that's not a requirement. I just want to get the information out. Uh, so. Uh, uh, we will go ahead and start the uh, PowerPoint presentation. There is uh, 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 there's 198 slides in this presentation. Do you think I can get through that in 50 minutes? I doubt it. So uh, this is my contact information. Feel free to contact me at any time. That is my cell phone number on there. So uh, I do answer that, uh, much to my wife's dismay. So. Uh, but uh, uh, any questions that you have uh, uh, associated with agricultural safety or health, uh, give me a call, send me an email, I'd be happy to get back with you. So that didn't do it. And so uh, I, these are the learning objectives, anybody who is associated with uh, uh, education. Uh, this is what we're going to really be talking about. But um, uh, So I hope you had those down good. Uh, these are the things that we're really going to talk about. We're going to talk about risk-taking behavior. We're going to talk a little bit about mechanism of injury, how to think about cause and effect. I've got some pictures that we're going to look at uh, to do that. A uh, little bit of, of ag do we have any ag engineers in the room? No? Okay. Good. You're learning a little bit about that and a little bit about physics and why farmers do what they do and a few of those other things as well. And so just, you know, I love the internet. Uh, back when I was your age, we certainly didn't have the internet. Uh, uh, we robbed, you know, little pictures from people. And uh, now they post them on the internet and, and any fool can download them, and so I do. And, and uh, uh, so here's just a couple of pictures dealing with people who are working at heights that maybe aren't doing things as safely as they should. Everything that I look at, I look at with the idea of I'm looking at something and there is going to be something wrong with that. What is the safety concern or what is the health concern? I want you to do that a little bit in these next few slides. And so we take a look at this picture. This is an iconic photo that was taken in 1932 during the RCA uh, building of the RCA building in New York City and uh, it's uh, 840 feet above ground. Now, the photographer that snapped this was an actual journalist, uh, and he took this picture on these guys' break. Uh, they normally did not do this during their break. They normally just sat on whatever girder, but he got them all to sit next to each other. This is an actual photo. Now, today, we would Photoshop something like that, uh, but there is no fall protection on any of these gentlemen. That's how things were done back in those days. But we take a look at that picture, and then we take a look at this picture, and we start thinking about, okay, what are the safety concerns that I might have with this? 
One of the things is, you know, the fellow's age, I'm going to say that he's uh, probably about 50 years old. And so by the time you hit 50, you start having some knee problems or some leg issues and, and you go to turn and you, and you go, oh man, that hurt. And you jerk a little bit and maybe you almost fall down. And if we're perched on top of a rock like that, as many feet as he is off the ground, that might be a concern. He doesn't have uh, good shoes on to be up there. Uh, uh, it's either uh, uh, Crocs or uh, uh, flip-flops or something of that nature. Both of his hands, you notice, are stuck in his pockets. And so what does uh, uh, somebody who walks on a, a, a trapeze wire, uh, how do they have their hands? They're out at their sides. It helps them balance. So he's got nothing going for him here. Plus he's, you know, a couple of pounds overweight maybe. <laughs> And, and all of that goes against him, and this is an accident waiting to happen. And we take a look then at this, and if you don't know anything about cheerleading other than you like to see people out uh, uh, doing cheers during a game of one kind or another, we've got about 15 to 20 feet off the ground for this gal. And, and we start thinking about, okay, what are the safety concerns of that? And, and my youngest son is a cheerleader or was a cheerleader in college. And, and I said, so how did they train you? He said, uh, what do you mean? And, and I said, well, did you throw bags of feet up in the air or bales of hay or something? And he's, no, we got spotters. Okay, so let's take a look at these spotters. This gal, is there a pointer on that? No. So. Let's take a look at this gal right here, and we start thinking about her job is to catch that gal that's up in the air, and she's not doing her job. Do you ever rely on somebody to get you out of a fix and they're not doing their job? That's a real safety concern that I have with doing something like this, uh, and, and that is one of the problems that we have with that. We switch then to a farmer who's up on top of a grain bin and he's got no fall protection on and, and that's very typical on farms across the United States. And, and uh, we think about the aspect of that and what might happen. A uh, 72 year old farmer up on top of his grain bin. Uh, the grain bin has just a little bit of frost on it. It's in the Midwest. Uh, it's it's uh, late fall. He turns around off of that and he slips off of that roof, drops 20 feet, lands on both feet, breaks both of his femurs, and as his body continues down, his knees hit him in the chest and break his sternum. He lays there for about three hours unconscious before his wife says, you know, Charlie hasn't come in for his morning cup of coffee yet. Maybe I should go out and check on it. And sure enough, there he is laying in a heap. He survived that, I'm not sure how, because if there's frost on the ground, it's gonna be pretty chilly and, and uh, he's got two broken femurs and a broken sternum, okay? And so what's the difference between all those pictures that we've seen in this one right here? Nothing. Nothing. So, so if we consider everything that's put into place on this, anybody here ever go to a water park? Maybe a few of you. And so uh, uh, they monitor how many people can go down that slide at one time. Uh, they put water down there as you're going so that you don't go all the way down. They've got a, a splash pad at the bottom that decelerates you. Everything is engineered so that there really is no hazard here, other than the major wedgie that you have as you get out of the splash pool at the end, you got no problem going down here. And that's why these, these businesses can stay open. Everything has been engineered out, whereas in all those other pictures, no engineering had been put into those at all. I don't really care if a person wants to risk their life. I don't really care. There are some horrific injuries here uh, depicted, uh, especially in the top right and the lower left. And, and if somebody wants to risk their life, that's fine with me, as long as it doesn't affect someone else directly. And so if I am a farmer and I have my children working with me or my grandkids, or I have a bunch of workers that I'm uh, showing them how to do a job, and I do something foolish, like any of the previous pictures we've shown or some of these, then shame on me for teaching them the wrong way. 
But if they're just out there doing the work themselves and they know the risk that's involved, that's fine. Same with these top left picture, at least those uh, young ladies have hard-toed shoes on and uh, uh, if we get far enough we'll see a picture of a person that did not. Uh, lower right picture, you want to go out and walk in the pasture and pet the bull, that's fine, go ahead. Uh, more power to you. So. I got a little air on, the, on both of those. Uh, the fella on the top left, he was concerned about his safety, but what do we know from looking at the picture? <laughs> he's going to be in a world of hurt. We're not sure how much air he got, uh, but he's coming down with his face on the concrete. <laughs> he's protected his elbows, he's protected his knees and shin, he's protected his skull, uh, but he's coming down face first and, and he's going to be biting the cement on that. Bottom right, he doesn't care. He's going he's gonna to be hurt probably worse. We're not sure how he's going to land, but uh, you know, it was more like, a, here, hold my beer and watch this kind of an event. And I do have to get on my soapbox with little kids every once in a while, just like uh, that uh, picture of the young lad on the uh, sheep a little bit earlier. I don't know how much, how fast we would have to go for these girls to be having fun, but it doesn't look to me like they're having fun. We could go slower, we could be do, doing things safer, and those kids would still be having a good time. We don't have to put our adult behavior onto them and transfer that and say, oh, we got to go really fast for anybody to have fun. Nah, no, you don't. No, you don't. Maybe some of you have done something like this, and, and uh, uh, so we take a look at this real quick, and, and what's the top hazard associated with this? Might be plugged in. Yeah, it could be. I'm more concerned with where do you think, and, and I'm going to make an assumption here that I probably shouldn't, but I'm going to say that mom was mixing the cake, and mom stepped away. Where was mom standing when she was mixing the cake? right in front of the mixer probably. And so this little child is standing on a footstool to the right of the mixer and I'm going to su suppose that she is leaning over like this holding on and if she falls number one cause of injury from this is going to be she falls off that step stool she's got a death grip on that mixer and she pulls the mixer down on top of her. Sure it could start but chances are her injury is going to be because that thing fell on her head. And so then, I, I, anybody here never been sunburned? All right. So they said that I was supposed to talk about poultry production. Back in my day, uh, this could have been me or my father uh, scooping out an old brooder house. Uh, and, and the exposures at that time would have been to the dust and uh, aerosolized uh, ammonia, uh, and that's about it. Uh, we would have had low numbers in that small house. Uh, that thing is only about 8 by 12 feet or so. Uh, you keep 20 chickens in there, and when it gets dirty, you scoop it out by hand. You're not wearing any kind of a mask. People didn't do that back then. We take a look at, uh, we're going to have a little bit of a progression here. Uh, a backyard business or an open range or uh, uh, loose uh, housing for the chickens and we're going to have these animals running a little bit loose there. Uh, we're not going to have much exposure to the dust and the ammonia uh, but those animals will be out on the ground and uh, pecking things that maybe we don't want uh, as part of the nutritional value of that egg and so people went to more mechanized mechanization. But the exposures to the ammonia, you'll see the, the gal there, uh, and if you don't know, Grant Wood painted this, uh, not with her coughing, but uh, I, Grant Wood painted this, a famous uh, Midwestern painter, basically. And, uh, uh, but the respiratory issues are real associated with uh, livestock production. Working in the grain bins, you do see the dust there. You see he's got a dust mask on. He is protecting his airway. Uh, approximately 70% of people who work in confinement, uh, livestock buildings, complain of respiratory issues. That's pretty high. 
we could reduce that not to zero, but we could do, reduce it to probably 10% if everybody would wear the proper uh, filtering face mask at the time. Again, exposure to dust while we're making feed. Uh, again, a little bit more of an open setting with turkeys uh, and with uh, chickens themselves out in the open. Uh, the dust is not a huge issue unless the wind is whipping it up. And so the ammonia level is not as high out there as well. When we grab the animals, we're actually stirring up the dust if we're inside. And so uh, typically when it's time for slaughter for these creatures, uh, we go in, we herd them into a, a smaller area, we grab them by the feet, we get beat by the wings, uh, we stir up the dust. Uh, the uh, injury level at those times is really pretty high. I, in the early days of the confinement uh, buildings, we had uh, people going in, uh, uh, adjusting the feeders, which is what this gentleman's doing, uh, no respiratory protection, uh, uh, situations in other countries as well where we're taking a look at, at production in those. Even today is not what it is here in the United States, and so the exposures are pretty high there, uh, and you can grab some pretty good pictures there. I'm not really sure what it is they're doing. Looks like they might be doing a little bit of cleaning, but they are all wearing dust masks, so that's a good thing. Uh, they are protecting their airway, and they're going to breathe easier at the end of the day because of that. Modern production puts animals in smaller cages. Uh, we can argue whether or not that's good or bad. Uh, uh, that's not a place for this particular class. Uh, but again, our exposure level goes up because the concentration of the animals goes up. Uh, just like if we are uh, in a, uh, if, you're, if you have younger brothers and sisters, for example, uh, they go to uh, elementary school, they get exposed to respiratory things, they bring that home and pretty soon the whole family is coughing and choking because they've picked it up from the kid. The kid got it at school where the exposure level was high. Well, the same thing in these buildings and the exposure animal to animal is high and also the exposure animal to worker is very high, uh, especially with the dust. And so uh, we take a look at, at large facilities like these and the dust exposure, while these look very clean, uh, the dust exposure is still pretty high. We're looking now at respirable dust. So the dust that you normally see in the air uh, or on uh, a dirt road or something like that, uh, or from the fields that the, that the wind picks up, that is not respirable dust. It stops uh, right about in here and you cough and you spit it up. Respirable dust goes down into the bottom of your lungs, causes in, uh, infection issues, and you don't get rid of that. That stays with you. Uh, he's in there uh, picking up dead birds, uh, so we have a little bit more of that as well. Uh, and, uh, and then again, just a couple more shots. So we take a look at a modern facility, and, and we have lots of mechanization there. Uh, lots of uh, chance to reduce the exposure uh, because we don't have to be in there as much as if we didn't have all of this stuff. It monitors the air, it monitors uh, the feed, it monitors the water, and it does all of those things automatically. We have a worker that goes in uh, for about an hour a day just checking things out, making sure that all of the monitors are working correctly. And so the exposure then in the poultry business is less because of that. These are, uh, each one of those lines represents a separate building uh, with thousands of animals in each. And again, we can argue whether or not that's good or bad, uh, but the reality is that not many people want to raise livestock of any kind anymore. And so fewer and fewer farmers raise them. The demand is still high for the meat uh, or the other products that they produce. And so we have to grow them some way. Uh, we see a niche there forming. Yes, I'll go into the business and I'll raise 100,000 turkeys a year or whatever it might be. Cleaning is really important. Uh, they disinfect everything uh, when the uh, current batch goes out so that that's not going to be an issue either. 
All right. Any questions or comments about the uh, poultry exposure? There are a number of slides here specifically referring to uh, respiratory issues. We're going to skip through those. And so uh, I, if you have questions and want to supplement your interest, uh, pick up a copy of this because I've left a copy of this on it as well. And there are a lot of issues. We do a 40-hour training program for nurses and physicians so that they can recognize some of the uh, exposures that farmers have and we've just finished one of those programs uh, and it talks about all of these things so all right so we take a look then at other livestock uh, they wanted me to talk about other livestock issues uh, certainly we have exposure to other animals aggressive animals uh, new mothers are uh, a particularly hazardous one especially if we're talking about the large animals like uh, cattle and horses and and the new uh, the new mothers can take issue with the fact that we're going to do something with their baby or they think that we might now this is not a Disney World this is not a PETA uh, this these animals can't think like that but they they know that nature through nature uh, that uh, there is a concern and so they'll show that concern we take a look at this picture and most people just simply say, wow, that's really nice. Cow and her newborn calf. And I look at that picture and I say the same thing. But then I start looking at the picture and there's three things that I notice about this cow. One is she's looking directly at the camera. Okay? Does it look to you like, th like that cow is looking directly at you? Okay. Does it look to you like she's looking directly at you? You know why? It, because she's looking directly at the camera. And if you're looking directly at the camera, just like the Mona Lisa effect, uh, you could walk all around this room and it would actually look to you like that cow is turning her head as you walk around the room. It's pretty neat and I've done it in several presentations. The second thing that I look at, I see her ears are cocked forward, okay? They're cocked forward because she's looking and she's listening for any kind of of hint that there is a concern for her baby. And the third thing that I look at, I see her body stance. And her body stance tells me, okay, when, if I were to, to walk around her, actually was in the field walking around her, she would shift her body, always showing her biggest side. Okay, now both sides are the same, but uh, you get the idea. She isn't going to be standing directly at me. She's going to be standing sideways because that's her big side. Just like if, if a bear is getting ready to attack, a lot of times it'll rear up on its rear uh, feet and put its paws up in the air and growl at you. Okay? You grab a cat that doesn't want to be grabbed and it'll arch its back and its hair will all stand up on, on end and, and it'll yowl at you. Cow can't do that. This is the best she's got. This is, this is, oh, this is how big I am. You should worry, basically, okay? And so when the cow attacks, it will inadvertently knock you down. It will hit you with its head or its shoulder, knock you down, and use its head to push you into the ground, breaking most of your ribs, all right? That's very typical. When somebody has been attacked by a cow, now, Less than 1% of the cows are going to do this, but somebody who's been attacked by a cow frequently has multiple broken ribs. If we have multiple broken ribs, we have punctured lungs, possibly the heart as well. Okay? Horse doesn't do those things. A horse, instead, will come at you, rear up, and paw you with its front hooves, or turn around and kick you. It will then stomp on you. It doesn't use its head to knock you into the ground. It may bite you. Cow won't bite you. Just the difference in the animal behavior. The owner of this foot thought that it was okay to walk in a paddock with horses with flip-flops on. She was wrong. Uh, the horses got a little bit too close to her. She didn't keep her feet moving and it slipped this skin right off the top of her foot. When a horse kicks you, now this picture was taken within an hour after this person was kicked in the leg, in the thigh, inner thigh, by a horse. And that's what shows 
within the first hour. Two days later, we have bruising from the groin, clear down past the knee. Actually, that will go down past and down into the foot. And the body has to absorb all that damaged tissue. This is something that we have to be seen for, not emergency-wise, uh, not immediately, but uh, we have to be seen because what they actually did to treat this, they opened it up and put a drainage tube in there so that all of that fluid could drain out. Okay. This is a particularly nasty injury. So the animals in, in that first introduction slide of the uh, livestock, uh, there was a, a part in there that, that talked about the size difference of the animals, and we see that very clearly here. Uh, a very old picture, back in the 50s we were bringing in large breeds from other countries, and this one came out of Italy. That's a bull in the center of that picture. I stepped into that pasture with the farmer's permission. I said, can I take pictures of your cows? He said, sure. And so I step over, and immediately that animal got up. And, and I said, ah, bull, click, and over the fence I am. <laughs> now, the animal was not aggressive, but the animal was showing its dominance by basically saying, these are my cows, what are you doing out here? And, and so I cleared out. I said, yeah, that's fine, they're your cows, I don't need them. So uh, I just got the one picture. Even though they're smaller, the hogs can be pretty deadly. And so we have uh, issues with especially knees. Uh, because, why? Well, because the animals are about this high and they weigh 250 pounds and a little bit of pushing sideways on your knee can pop a knee out or uh, otherwise injure a knee. And so if we fall, if we were to have a seizure or a heart attack or get injured and down with the animals, they would eat you, okay? And I don't know, there's been a couple of TV shows with that as part of the basis. Sheep, not nearly as big a problem, but you don't want to present them a target. You would not want to walk into that pen with a bucket of feed, dump that feed out, set the bucket down and bend over to pick something up because that animal would challenge you and immediately come after you, okay? We have a lot of low back injuries, hip injuries from that, uh, from sheep especially, uh, but, but it's not as uh, death-inducing as some of the other breeds. We also have uh, potential injuries because of spooked animals, wild animals, startled animals, and, and working and processing them. I like to show this picture to producers and to veterinarians. This uh, lady is a veterinarian, so she treats large animals, and on this particular farm they did not have the equipment necessary to hold that animal securely. And so she wraps her arm around its neck like that, around its head rather, and is actually giving it a syringe full of stuff down its throat, uh, some kind of antibiotic probably, uh, and giving that dose down its throat. All that animal has to do is toss its head and she ends up with a rotator cuff problem. Okay? This is not a tough thing for that animal to do. It weighs over a thousand pounds. Uh, that animal with a toss of its head could pick her up right off the ground. Not a problem at all. And yet, it's kind of like the guy driving down the highway with the mattress on top of his roof with his arm out. Yeah, that's going to work. You know, well, she's not going to be able to hold that animal securely either. I watched this one unfold at a county uh, fair uh, many, many years ago before I became a safety specialist. The, the farmer talked with the woman. Something was said, I didn't hear it. She picked up the kid out of the stroller, gave the kid to him. He walks over, puts the kid on the animal's back. Now, in this country, we don't breed beef animals to ride on their backs unless they're bucking bulls. This animal uh, is a, a county fair animal. It probably was not broke to lead more than two or three weeks ago. It's never been off the farm. It's never been exposed to the sights, sounds, smells, excitement of a county fair. Now we're putting an animal on its back and, and the animal is basically, if it were able to think, was saying, 
what the hell is going on? And bouncing around, it can't go forward, it's tied up, it can't go back, it can't go to its right, so what's it do? It comes this way. That animal weighed 1,145 pounds. I looked uh, afterwards. The man, probably a couple hundred pounds. The kid, 20 maybe. And if we never take pictures, so I was the one who took the picture, I didn't give them to them. If we never take pictures and we never talk about it, that two-year-old kid is never going to remember the situation. So why put him in harm's way? I don't get that. I just don't get it. Now we're to the subject that I really love, mechanics. And so we're going to talk about injuries caused by equipment and machinery. And uh, uh, we've got about 20 minutes to do that. So I, uh, we're going to talk about tractors mostly because tractors account for about 50% of all fatalities that occur on farms in the United States. 50%. And about 50% of those are because a tractor rolled over. So simple math, 25% of all farm fatalities are caused because a tractor <laughs> rolled over and crushed the occupant. Okay? And so uh, if we look at the number of people die, if we, if we just look at the number of people die, everybody says, okay, so what? 450 people. That's, that's a shame for those 450 families, but in the bigger scheme of things, with 40,000 people dying from motor vehicle crashes each year, uh, it's not a big issue. But the reason that we're interested in is because of the rate. It's eight times the rate of all the other occup occupations put together. Eight times. And so we, we take a look at, if you compare farmers with everybody else, the farmer is eight times more likely to die on his job than any other person in any other occupation. Eight times. About 20 die per year in North Carolina. Stress, long hours, these are all things that are a part of that. We looked at uh, the picture of the farmer on top of the grain bin, working alone, doing something that he was familiar with doing. Uh, traditionally, he always went up there, hazardous situation, working at a height. Uh, those all come into play on that. As I said, tractors account for 50%, and of those 50% are uh, tractor overturns. They have a high center of gravity, so uh, we've been behind the equipment. We'll look at some pictures on roads in a minute. 97% are male. That's just the demographic, ladies. That's not because you all are better drivers. Uh, and so if we take a look at the, at the two basic types of overturns, Side overturns account for about 85% of all overturns, but only 35% of those are fatal. If we look at a rear overturn, 85% of those are fatal. It takes about a second and a half either way for the tractor to roll over. So what's the difference in the fatality rate? Well, let's take a look at this picture. So if we take a look at this picture, that tractor is laying on its side. All right. So no opportunity there for it to crush the operator. And besides, there's a cab. That may be good, may be bad. If he had his seat belt fastened, it's good. If he didn't have his seat belt fastened, well, then he kind of bounces around in there. Uh, but at least he's protected somewhat. 1986 is when they started putting cabs on all tractors. Cabs are a roll bar and the seat belt comes with it. What percentage of farmers wear their seat belt always? One percent. One percent. Pretty low. It's not required. Uh, but this is a very typical rollover. We take a look at that. They were out uh, mowing an area, uh, got too close to a ravine, a ditch, uh, a low area, uh, went over a big gopher mound on the top, whatever it might be, and it flipped that tractor over. And there's a difference in, in operators. If we take a look at, if this was a 25-year-old, so that hits kind of close to home here, a 25-year-old has a good grip and they can maintain it, okay? And so as that tractor's rolling over and they're saying, oh, dad's gonna kill me, and he flips it over on the side and he's basically sitting there just like this and he's going, oh, dad is gonna be after me. And he lets go and he gets out and he's not injured. 
very typical. 75 year old, same thing. He's probably got a better grip than most of you, but he can't hold it. He's been farming all his life, and now the rheumatism is getting to him a little bit, a little arthritis going on there, maybe uh, some other things as well, and he can't hold that grip as long, and he, he rolls, he hits, and he lets go, and he bounces around in there just like a BB in a tobacco tin, and he gets injured because of that. His bones are more brittle, and so that adds more potential for injury because of all of those factors. It isn't always in a nice, easy place to get to. If we take a look at a rear overturn, we saw that the side overturn ended on its side. A lot of them do. In a rear overturn, it goes more than 90 degrees most of the time. So a side overturn, it goes 90 degrees. In a rear overturn, if it went 90 degrees, it'd be straight up in the air. I do have some pictures of those, but it's pretty rare. And so usually it goes a full 180. If every side overturn went 180 degrees, we'd have a lot more fatalities from side overturns as well. It wouldn't just be 35%. So that's the next one in the series of three that uh, this photographer took. And the, op the operator is, you see him right by the feet of that guy. I don't know what that guy thought he was gonna do, but. Uh, Disproportionate number of children and seasoned farm workers working on farms, and so we have a disproportionate number of both those age groups that get injured or killed on farms. All right. People who get run over by a tractor, okay? We're not talking about a tractor rolling over, but people who get run over by it. 50% of them fall from the tractor. A lot of those are kids. 27% uh, are bystanders, and uh, we have something like this. Somebody's sitting on a fender, uh, hopefully because they're giving instruction to the person that's driving, uh, rather than just, hey, give me a ride to the field, uh, but that could be an issue. Uh, small children <coughs> on tractors and equipment, uh, because we don't necessarily have good daycare on the farms in the United States, and, and extended families, are moving away now. Uh, uh, we're maybe a little bit more affluent than we were 50 years ago, and so now we can afford to move to Arizona where the weather's nicer or uh, you know whatever you might like. And so this becomes an issue as well, people falling off the tractor or off the implement. And uh, uh, there was a a uh, crash in Maine, I think, last year or the year before, 18 people injured in a hay rack ride. Uh, the tractor was not big enough for the hay rack. Uh, the hay rack pushed it down into a ravine, 18 people injured. And I'm thinking, how does somebody not see that coming? I, d I just don't understand. An uh, eight-year-old child was doing exactly this in central Iowa. I, I did the follow-up investigation. Uh, uh, it was a rainy, muddy day in Iowa. Uh, the farmer's foot slipped off his clutch as he was backing up, helping uh, uh, with the child helping him hook up to that piece of equipment. And dad's foot slipped off the clutch. The tractor lurched backwards. The tractor ran over the boy and crushed his pelvis, eight years old. There are devices on the market that you don't have to hold the tongue. You can back up to an approximate amount and get off that tractor and hook it up yourself. Uh, there are a number of different ways that you can do that safely. This is not one of them. Bystanders, so this uh, boy is, is in the uh, barnyard playing, uh, up in the yard playing. Dad drives in, he's in a hurry, he's not paying attention. He doesn't even know Johnny's outside and Johnny comes running after him. Dad's worried about those storm clouds out there and whether or not he can get another load of manure out to the field or not. And, and so he, he stops the tractor, he puts it in reverse and he backs up. Joey's right behind him, he drops the ball and gets run over. Okay, That's how those things occur. Roadway incidents account for about 13% of tractor fatalities. So we're still dealing with tractors. I, I said that, that we'd talk about equipment. 
Tractors is the biggest cause of fatalities on the farm, by far. This tractor was struck by a semi. Uh, this is a, a 150 horse uh, powered tractor, which is pretty decent size and it ripped it in half. It flipped the semi over into the ditch and destroyed the semi as well. Uh, this tractor pulling a, a wagon uh, was struck by a semi from behind, had proper lighting and marking on. The semi just didn't recognize it quickly enough. It takes, you know, with the tractor going about 15 to 20 miles an hour and you driving, well, you drive faster than me, but uh, uh, with me <coughs> driving 55, uh, it's going to take about four to five seconds for you to stop, okay? For you to recognize that it's a tractor, slow down appropriately, and so that you don't run into the back of it and the truck driver just wasn't paying attention. You know, we talked about talking on cell phones before, distracted driving, that is playing a bigger role in farm equipment injuries too. This is how much room they take up. I'm not sure I've seen a road quite this wide in, in North Carolina other than the interstates. Uh, and so mostly we get on these little back roads in North Carolina and one tractor is taking up about half to two-thirds of the roadway uh, with the equipment that it's on. This is on a, a rural road in Iowa. Uh, the roads are much wider, the equipment's bigger, uh, and that's part of the reasoning behind that. Uh, but you see how much room, this was also in Iowa, you see how much room that uh, combine takes up, and it has the header removed, that's the wider part that sticks on the front. This one was struck here in, uh, no it wasn't either, uh, in the Midwest, that was a pickup truck, uh, the occupant died. These were both in North Carolina. Sometimes it jumps. And so uh, uh, this one is a, a staged photo, I've got a picture of it with the wings up as well. Uh, but the equipment is wide, it takes up a significant portion of the traveled roadway. And that's okay by law. Uh, and here in North Carolina, we're one of only eight states that don't require you to have a, uh, what I'll call a huge amount of lighting and marking on it. Uh, in other states, they require an orange triangle. You've probably seen those to mark the ends of driveways. Uh, in most states, they use that on slow moving equipment. Like this one here, uh, you'll notice this. That is the slow moving vehicle emblem. Uh, that's not a very good one. I almost struck this. I got off work at five o'clock. Uh, it was just dusk in October and I, I was probably fiddling with my radio or thinking about the work I'd done that day or something and, and not paying enough attention and thought, oh, whoa, slow down and I hit the brakes and then, wow, that'll be a good photo. So I took the picture through my windshield because that's always safe. And I, I, you know, you've probably taken pictures of stupid stuff too. <laughs> five minutes later, five minutes later, I come across this one. Uh, pixels are bad. Uh, we I, I put it down too low of resolution at one point, and I don't have the original anymore. But this was five minutes later. Much different scenario. This is what those triangles are supposed to look at like. This is just with the sun on them in the middle of the day. Think about what lights do to that at night. It lights up the whole piece of equipment uh, so that you recognize it right away and that's what's required in most states. So we take a look at injuries and we take a look at uh, uh, the biggest concerns on farms. One of the biggest and fastest growing causes of injury and fatalities on farms is ATVs. Uh, ATVs, UTVs, uh, and uh, gators and that sort of thing. The four-wheelers are bad, three-wheelers are worse, but the four-wheelers are bad because everybody has a four-wheeler or has had and they run them all the time. Now this one is a staged uh, scenario. We've got that uh, thing on a jack and everybody's acting like they're all prepared there. We know that it's staged because if a tractor takes one and a half seconds to roll over, how long would a four-wheeler take? maybe a second, 
And so it takes three quarters of a second for your brain to say, oh, there's a problem here. I better do something about it. And yet already grandma's reacting. And so I'm, I'm thinking this whole thing is staged and uh, uh, the kids are not falling off. But if we consider that they might be, we're going to have some pretty serious injuries as that thing flips over backwards, comes down on both of those kids as well as on top of grandma. I'm just saying. Four-wheeler versus a, a car on a highway. How many of you would like to be doing that right now instead of being in here? Yeah, me That's too. Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully this wasn't you on Saturday. Close. Or this. <laughs> or this. <laughs> or this. <laughs> now some of these are also staged. A helmet against the highway. Uh, so it's real important that if you are using equipment like this, that's fine. I don't have an issue with that. Uh, but it's a good idea to at least wear the helmet and some of the other protective equipment would be good as well. Uh, don't ride tandem on a four-wheeler. They're not designed for that. Uh, and, and so uh, that can also uh, cause instability. Machinery, self-propelled machines, uh, number one cause of injury was self-propelled equipment. Things like tractors, things like combines, cotton harvesters, uh, tobacco harvesters, a lot of self-propelled equipment. Number one cause of injury is slips and falls from the operator station. And so we take a look at a piece of equipment like this. And we think, wow, there's so much you can get caught in, and there really is. But the number one cause of injury is slips and falls coming down that ladder. Why? Well, because they come down like this. They're not facing that ladder with three points of contact. They're facing away from it. And each time they come down a step, they are closer and closer to falling off of there. You think about your own home, and we're going to be done here in about two minutes. You think about in your own home, as you come down stair steps, if you're not holding on to the railing, can you stop mid-step? As you are coming down, you cannot stop because you don't have that kind of control. <coughs> well, that is a seven and a quarter inch fall. Okay, We fall down the step. We fall down the step, all right? And, and the thing that makes it not an injury is the fact, number one, it's controlled by the fact that it's only seven and a quarter inches. And number two, we do it a hundred times, a thousand times a day. It's not a big deal. As we come down those steps, if your kid brother left a bunch of Legos on that step and you notice it, right as you're about ready to step on them and you can't stop, what's your first reaction? Jump or step over them. And then you notice the cat on the next step <laughs> and you're messed up, okay? The same thing here, only it's a 20 inch step and now we're coming down on rough ground, we're coming down on rocks, sod clumps or whatever and if we lose our footing or make a jump, we end up with a rolled ankle like this. Okay? All right. It is 520. I, I was scheduled to speak until now. There's probably another hundred slides in this presentation. You are welcome to use any or all parts of it. Uh, if you give me credit, that's fine. If you don't give me credit, I don't care. I, I pulled this from other people's presentations. I've been doing similar presentations for 25 years. Uh, and you are welcome to any and all of these. Uh, take them home, scare your folks with them, uh, do whatever, don't care. Uh, if you have questions about any of the particular injuries depicted, I send me an email and I'd be happy to tell you any story that goes with those. There are about 100 children killed on farms in the United States every year doing farm work. There's other kids killed on farms 
uh, that are not doing farm work, but just like that little kid who got run over, that would not be a farm related uh, because the kid is not involved in farming. And so about 100 children lose their lives. I read the, the specs on each and every one of those that comes across my desk. Uh, and a couple came across uh, just today an ATV fatality in uh, South Carolina and uh, a tractor fatality in uh, Vermont, I think. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I track all of these kinds of things. I've got a bunch of stories and would be happy to share more with you. So uh, thank you for your time. Any questions before we break? All right, thank, thank you. you.